I do is I study processes of interaction among people at the workplace. And I'm interested both in how the work gets done and also how organizations and institutions influence how the work gets done. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. But my work has also sort of had a dash of like science studies in it pretty much as long as I can remember. My very first ethnography was um, a lab study basically of laboratory technicians. And I also spent about a year or two working at Xerox Park in the, in the early 90s with the anthropologists there. So I have that sort of science studies bent from a long, long time ago. Um, and so the project I'm gonna talk about today kind of reflects all those different interests. And essentially, um, it's a study of the social organization of forensic science. And um, I, I basically did about 18 months of field work in a crime laboratory. And uh, about a month after I um, started my field work in 2009, the National Academy of Sciences came out with this report, um, which basically said that forensic science kind of lacked any science um, for the most part except for DNA, which is an important part of the story. But everything else kind of needed strengthening in terms of the scientific basis of it. The system, obviously, many of you probably know this better than me, if, you're, uh, fill, you, know, if you know something about the law, system kind of needed money <laughs> and resources, but also standardized procedures, more training, that sort of stuff. Um, and generated a lot of attention. Uh, it's one of these things as an ethnographer that you're like, awesome, like this happened the first week I was here. Um, but uh, it also externally kind of generated a lot of criticism of forensics. So this is just a quote from the New York Times. It came out like the week of the report. Product of, product of so shoddy science, basically. Um, I was very disappointed on Science Friday to hear Ira Flato, you know, say that the forensic science world is not so scientific. Um, so that was what was kind of going on when I first started my field work. Um, and this is kind of still the situation for forensic science. So I went online yesterday just to see what I could find. And pretty much any time I give a talk, I can find something new somewhere out there that says forensic science is junk science and we're not doing anything about it. Kind of the story. Um, and, but I think what's important here is to remember is that it's not just about the science, right? Um, a lot of these kind of the attention that forensic science gets is about junk science, shoddy science, but science is a, it's a social and cultural institution, right? So the way science is done, um, it's embedded in a whole set of organizational and institutional structures that also matter. Um, so what I'm trying to do with this project is really look at what is it that forensic scientists do? Because the work itself is kind of messy work, and I firmly believe that when you look at what people do, you get a d different sense for sort of what the problems and tensions are than you would get from a sort of broader perspective. And so that's kind of what I'm doing with this project. And um, here's my really, really academic slide. So um, my approach is sort of a work and organizations approach uh, in which I look at, you know, the production of scientific evidence through that kind of lens. I really believe that interaction is really um, occurring within social worlds. So what people are doing when they're with one another is they're not responding to sort of broad social structures, but they're really responding to their own interpretation of the situation that they're in. Um, however, and so these sort of institutional influences, so in the field of organization theory, you hear a lot about institutional influences nowadays, um, but these are all experienced um, and encountered through how people interact with each other. So I think that the interaction order is really an important part of how um, institutions sort of get in instantiated in, in the real world. Um, and for me in particular, what I look at is sort of how does the, how, how do people make sense or how do they make meaning out of their work and how does that matter? Mm -hmm. So whether it's sort of occupational values, which I've looked at in other contexts, or in particular, I, w I look at work practices, I look at what people do, um, because I think that that really tells you something about what's going on. Okay, so the question that I'm asking here is sort of when you have something, forensic evidence is essentially something that's sci thought of as scientific truth and at the same time it's thought of as legal proof. And when you have this, um, how does that tension between those two things structure the work of forensic scientists? Um, and so the idea of truth versus proof kind of reflects the notion that in these two worlds, law and science, these things have different meanings. They matter differently. Um, and because forensic science is 
sort of at the intersection of these two worlds, it's kind of pulling them in different directions in terms of what they do. I doubt there's anybody who hasn't seen some sort of CSI show. So I thought it was worth sort of um, telling you a little bit about what a forensic scientist really does as opposed to what we see on TV. So um, they aren't sort of these hybrid geeky investigator slash gun toting heroes that we see on TV, but in fact they're really mostly bench scientists. Right, so the main part of the job is really applied science. They have bachelor's degrees and master's degrees in biology, chemistry. Some of them have additional sort of forensic science degrees. And they work in a lab analyzing evidence. And that comes from a, a sort of variety of different scientific disciplines. So you got forensic biology, which is sort of what we think of the DNA stuff. Um, controlled substances, which is narcotics, which is m more of a chemical discipline, chemistry, right? Um, trace evidence, comparative evidence. Comparative evidence is things like um, firearms and tool marks or um, footprint analysis, uh, latent fingerprints. Those are sort of the comparative evidence disciplines. And then toxicology, which is analysis of drugs in the body, not, not narcotics, which is outside of the body. And so that's mostly what they do. They sit at lab benches. like, And so this started out as sort of a lab study. Um, but at the same time, what they never show on CSI is actually that they go into court, right? And so a lot of the work um, is, it's not a lot of the time that they spend because they don't go into court very often, but they spend a lot of time creating reports that get used in the court. Um, but they also do interact with investigators, with judges, with juries, with lawyers. And so that's a part of the job. Um, okay, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about the context of um, forensic science and kind of the way it's organized. This top thing is a Latin thing I don't know how to pronounce, but it's the motto of a, of a criminalist association. Um, it essentially means justice done through science. Um, the organizational structure of crime laboratories is kind of a little patchworky. So I thought it was going to be like the DMV, you know, kind of like you see a crime, one crime lab, you've seen them all, but it's really not. They've sort of ar arisen more um, locally, and so they look kind of different. Um, the labs report to different criminal justice agencies, so you can have a lab that report. Th there are FBI labs around the country. Um, there are Department of Justice labs, which are actually state labs. There are a lot of labs are housed in um, police departments or sheriff's departments, and then there are district attorney labs that are housed that report to the district attorney instead of to the police. There are some private labs, but they don't do the bulk of the um, evidence analysis in the U.S. So that's kind of what it looks like. Um, and typically, by the way, it's like in the basement of some police building. Yeah. Well, it differs by state and jurisdiction. So um, uh, t some in some jurisdictions, toxicologists actually work in the coroner's office. And in New York, I think many of the, th the some of the criminalists work in the coroner's office. I did my study on the West Coast, so I don't, I don't know as much about what they do here. Um, but so toxicology often is with the coroner because they're analyzing icky stuff. Um, it, but um, like if you were a, if you were um, ballistics doing ballistics analysis, you wouldn't really interact with that office at all, typically. Um, okay, so the other key thing is that the agency, whatever agency it is that the lab is within, actually controls the laboratory budget. Um, that was key, by the way, to why I never got into a bunch of labs. We were talking about access in the beginning. Um, so the labs have a close relationship with law enforcement in that respect. Um, the other thing that I think is important to sort of bring out at the very beginning is this is the different sort of logics, norms, and practices that come from science and come from law. Um, these are felt very strongly by the forensic scientists. So um, their sense is that science is really something that's about knowledge, it's objective, um, they're very cautious, science is also sort of a communal process. Um, and you, and in my first few weeks in the lab, I was like, wow, I'm hearing like Merton all over the place among these analysts. Um, and they really, you know, they're doing standard bench science and they'll say things like, well, I don't have a horse in the race. It doesn't matter to me what the results say, right? All the, you know, so that's their approach and they contrast this with the, with the lawyers and they say all the lawyers care about is winning. 
Yes. It varies by discipline. Yes. Uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, while yes. scientists have this thing about probabilistic. Yes. How do you merge the two? That's the whole story of this discipline, of this field, right, in the work, is about how do you sort of balance what we think of as science and what we know <laughs> to be messy and fallible, which they all would agree, um, with what is it that the lawyers want from the evidence. Yeah. Um, so from the perspective of justice, you have this sense of this is about um, the public interest, um, it's very bureaucratic for obvious reasons. Accountability is really important. Um, most important, I think, in terms of the distinction is this adversarial aspect of looking for truth. So in many ways, like these, these two logics kind of overlap, right? So like, um, if you read Jasanoff, like she talks about sort of the difference between law and science and how, how um, they're both about knowledge production. It's just that they have different ideas about how you get to that. Right, so fact making in law is about creating knowledge related to justice in a particular case, um, where, where in science it's really more about generalizable truths and, um, and truths from nature that we build upon over time, right? Um, and, but in practice, these things actually do have a lot of overlaps that work well together, right? So it makes sense. If you are a bench scientist, you are really meticulous about documenting every last thing that you do. Um, and if you're a lawyer or a, if you're in the justice system, you're very concerned about chain of custody. So you are documenting every last thing that you do. So are there, there are ways sort of that you think about, to think about this that are, very, that are very much overlapping and the same. And then there's also a bunch of tensions. And I'm gonna focus, I think, probably more on the tensions. Um, so what did I do? I, I, uh, you guys are familiar with what ethnography is, so I'm not gonna like, Oh yeah, you'd like me to tell, say a little more? All right, a little bit, okay. So, I spent 18 months in a crime laboratory, which I'm calling Western County Crime Laboratory. Um, it's kind of a large, why? Um, I don't have to, I, I did not um, agree to, you know, they, they didn't ask, and so I never said it would be anonymous, but I always anonymize because I feel like, um, there are things that I might see that people might not want other people to know who they were. So I try to make it as anonymous as possible, typically. But yeah. On that point. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm making your job hard, aren't I? This may or may not be uh, relevant, but one question that's come up for me in studying organizations is when the actual real life identity of the organization um, impacts the meaning making and interpretation yes. and so I'm wondering if that has played in or maybe that you can save that for later it seems a little tangential but that um, raise it. yeah I mean we can save it for later but what I will say is that in this case I don't think it does um, I think it um, I've been to other laboratories and I think it's relatively similar um, and I think in some ways it has affected the things that I'm able to say because I don't want to reveal what lab I studied um, okay, so what did I do? There were five or six units in there, and you can kind of see, I started in DNA. There were The numbers, by the way, are the numbers of analysts. I don't know if you can read this, but it's a pretty large lab, like 65 people. Um, there were 18 in DNA. There were seven who did controlled substances. There were a bunch who did toxicology, comparative evidence, um, firearms. There were fewer. Um, I spent a year and a half there. I usually like to participate in the settings that I study, so I've done the work, like I've been an assembler, and I worked in film production for some of my prior projects. This was not possible in this environment. Um, I, I was able to try the techniques on my own samples, so like I did indented writing analysis on something that I wrote, and I did, I actually am in the database. Um, of the state, my DNA is in there because I did a, I did a DNA analysis of, on my own cheek swab because I really feel like it's important to sort of get a, a feel for what it is to do the work. So I did some of that. I toured some labs. I did a bunch of, I attended professional meetings. I, I did a bunch of formal interviews at the end and, um, and now I'm sort of in the analysis phase which is essentially grounded theory. I have a ton of data which I had been in you know, analyzing all along and thinking about all along, and now it's just me and my data, and, and you guys and other people who kind of help me talk about it. Okay, that's not useful. 
where am I? Oh, so what am I going to do? I have three things I'm going to talk about, sort of three moments in the production of evidence in a crime laboratory. The first is the paper that I sent, which is really a paper about analyzing evidence. Um, the second is a story I'm going to tell about writing reports. And the third is about testifying in court. I'm going to try and tell a quick-ish story about each one of these and sort of what I think is important about them. Um, and I think there's a few things that will run through all of them. First of all, there's been a lot of change in technological standards in forensic evidence, and mostly as a result of DNA analysis. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about sort of uh, accountability and what that means. And then I'm also going to talk about sort of this sense of balancing the tensions between science and law. So the first uh, moment in terms of analyzing the evidence um, Basically, just to give you a quick summary, there's been, since DNA analysis became pretty much the gold standard of evidence, um, it is changing the standards across the board for all the other subfields in forensics. And they have what I call DNA envy, which is to say there's a lot of pressure for all these other subfields to be more like DNA. Um, in my lab, they actually called the DNA analysts DNA princesses. Um, there were more women than men, but um, I thought that was very telling. Um, they get a lot more resources, basically, in DNA than the other subfields. And it, this envy has had differential effects across the different types of other subfields. And I don't have time to tell you all the stories. My paper has a bunch of different ones about narcotics analysts, about toxicologists, and about um, firearms examiners. And I'm just going to tell you the story about the firearms examiners, because I don't have time to go through all of them. Um, the firearms guys have been under the most pressure for change, um, essentially because they can, they're a very different kind of science than DNA. <laughs> um, and they, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Basically, um, the way DNA works is that um, it sort of has become the gold standard of evidence, and this is not just from a scientific perspective, but also from a legal perspective, kind of both. Um, and it's changed the meaning of what it means to sort of be scientifically objective, if you will, in terms of the forensic evidence. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the details. There's actually a whole book on this. It's, um, it's by Lynch, Cole, McNally, and Jordan. It's, a, it's called The Truth Machine, about sort of how DNA um, sort of how DNA evidence kind of rose to be the gold standard. Um, basically what happened is in the 90s, PCR enables analysts to really quickly and easily develop a DNA profile. So it used to be much more complicated and quite honestly you needed a lot more blood. Um, now you can do a DNA profile off of that fingerprint that I just put on this table, right? So off of the little bits of skin and oil that come off of people, you can get a profile from that. Um, so it became a lot easier to get, to get these profiles from biological fluids. And of course, this was kind of a new science. So there was this whole period where there were lots of court challenges. But I think the, the sort of the jury's in, if you will, or whatever, I don't know. DNA has become basically scientifically unassailable evidence in the courtroom. Um, in reality, I want to point out, I'm not somebody who thinks that DNA evidence is infallible. I totally think it's fallible. It is, it's a biological science. It is just as messy as these other sciences are. Um, it's not as objective as we would, you know, maybe the, as it appears. However, it is definitely considered to be the gold standard. The way it works for DNA is basically you get a set of samples of biological fluids. The analyst then separates those out, um, and they take the sample and they put it on this machine, um, which is um, which produces what are called electropherograms, which basically, I mean, it's much more complicated than this, but I'm just simplifying it. But basically, what comes out at the end <laughs> is an electropherogram that shows you at each particular locus what the alleles are in that sample. And then what they do with that is they make a table that compares the suspect's alleles with the alleles that they found at the crime scene. So maybe you have a blood stain, it has a certain profile, and then they take blood or a cheek swab from um, a suspect, and they can then show you very nicely and neatly the way that it matches in a table. Um, 
The other thing they do is they give you a very complicated probabilistic statistical analysis of, um, based on population statistics in DNA, on whether or not the person is a match. Um, they will say something like this, the suspect is included, blah, 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 the probability that they, it's a random person is one in 260 billion in the Caucasian population. That is a teeny, 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 tiny probability that we don't have the guy, right? But they do do it probabilistically. Um, so I think what's important about this and the ways that it's influenced the other fields is that it went through a super long vetting in the courts to kind of get to where the practice and the presentation of DNA evidence is today. Um, the reports look extremely scientifically objective. They are graphs, they're tables, they're population statistics. And so this visual and statistical record creates like a sense of scientific objectivity that these other fields lack to varying degrees. So with DNA, you can go over this record, you can see um, all of the printouts from the various electropherograms. Um, there you can quantify how certain you are. Um, and there's piles of documentation that you then provide the court with. And this is kind of what it looks like. So what does that mean? What it means is there's a bunch of other subfields that are, that are producing forensic evidence that don't have this. And there's been a lot of pressure on them to produce more of this. And it comes from a variety of places. And I'm going to tell you about firearms, because firearms is the most obviously different um, in terms of what they do. So it's a comparative um, evidence discipline. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Just, just on this previous slide, this is a hypothesis test, right? So uh, am I right in reading it that it's saying, um, assuming that this sample, like it, it, this, is, this is a probability of obtaining this combination of alleles from finding a person at random, but that doesn't tell you directly the probability that this sample came from a, like that particular person, right? It's a statistical analysis. I wouldn't say it's a hypothesis test. Okay. <laughs> All right. I have to think about that. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And so how can it be... Why is it messy? What's messy in this, in the DNA aspect? Okay, so what's messy in it is that, so first of all, there's getting from here to there, which is you have to extract, um, make sure the extraction goes well, right? Then um, there's this machine, which pr you know like pushes electricity into the samples and has a dye that's um, going through all the different things. Um, and then it produces this, which can be affected both by the electricity as, as, as well as like all the other things. So for instance, if, um, I'm looking for somebody with genes, if I took a sample from your pants, they would be, it would be a very, what they would say is it's a dirty sample, right? So there's all these other things in there um, that can complicate, <laughs> um, make, make, it, make the outcome not as clear. They have what's called stutter, you can see a little bit of stutter on this sample. Like, um, it's just a little bit from the electrical impulses. Then they, um, it's complicated because, especially nowadays, it's very complicated because they do a lot of mixture interpretation. So we don't know how many people created the sample on this table. I mean, how many people have touched this table besides me, right? Like, so if you took a sample of that, there could be four or five people's DNA in it. And you can't actually say how many. They're making um, educated guesses about how many people are in the sample. Mm -hmm. They're making guesses about which alleles belong to which person. It is not neat. And they try to account for those with the statistics. Oops, that's the other direction. Um, but it's definitely, not, it's definitely open to interpretation. The analysts spend a lot of time interpreting it. They spend a lot of time talking to each other and checking each other's interpretations. Do you think this is stutter? What do you think about this? So it's not just like the thing comes off the instrument and you have an answer. It's not like taking temperature or something. OK, so firearms. So firearms is comparative evidence. They look through a comparative microscope, and they make matches of um, bullets and cartridge casings by looking at what's called the striae, which are the little tiny markings that different um, 
lands and grooves in other parts of the barrel of a firearm or the firing pin. You know, different parts of the gun make on this as it shoots it out of the gun. Um, in the case of firearms, there's been a, a lot of external pressure um, for the discipline to change, um, which is coming from the media, from the courts, from this NAS report, basically saying like there's not any scientific basis for a match in um, in this comparison. So like other people talk about it in the lab, and they'll say, oh, you know, in tool marks, the rap on tool marks is be like DNA. You guys should be like DNA. Why can't you be more like DNA, right? So everybody's sort of aware that there's a lot of pressure on them. They're very aware of it. One of the things that I saw was I went to a a criminalist association meeting, like a big statewide one, and, and a firearms examiner kind of got up and talked about his own experiences with giving testimony, and he had like a PowerPoint presentation with his 10 most wanted list, and they were all these academics who had filed briefs saying that firearms testimony was very flawed. Um, and he was talking about how do you defend against these allegations that it's flawed, um, and so it was very interesting, but they're, they're feeling a lot of pressure. Um, and they also have developed a new method to do firearms analysis. So instead of just looking, they actually um, quantify their identification by counting what are called um, consecutively matching striae. So it's called CMS. And it's based on a statistical analysis of a database of best known non-matches from guns from the same ma manufacturer. So this is how many you'd have to have to be able to distinguish one gun from another gun from the same manufacturer. And then they will say, when they make assertions about it, they will say things like, you need two groups of three consecutively matching striae or whatever. Um, <coughs> what do I see with this? I basically see that the way they're responding is to try and get more in terms of visibility of the evidence, in terms of verifiability, to be able to show that it's more like DNA. Um, so two of the firearms examiners were talking to me about CMS and how it kind of works, and one of them said, you know, oh, well, we, people like CMS because numbers are easy to understand. They're universal, and everybody knows what they mean. Um, when he says that, he's not talking about all the scientists, the forensic scientists, right? He's talking about juries <laughs> and that they know what you mean if you put numbers on it. Or they, they talk about, um, well, in the lab we used to say, I know it like I know my mother's face. Um, and now we can't say that anymore and instead we have to bring in digital images. So we have to um, document. And in today's lab, you better have the images to back it up. So they're taking digital images of all of their comparisons and bringing them with them um, to court. Um, their notes that they take on all the cases contain basically digital images of all of the matching striae that they find, the firing pin impression, the extractor marks. They go through it all, and they take lots and lots of pictures. And they say, you know, you want the note packet to um, support it on the stand. So multiple outsiders have seen my work, one analyst told me, and they've reviewed it, and it's never been challenged. So again, they're thinking about sort of the environment that they're in. He's accountable for his conclusions. Um, it's not just about the science, right? But it's about accountability to a bunch of different people. They also have, they, are, they get second opinions. So it's not just one person's analysis of what they saw through the microscope. But they have a second analyst who signs off on every one of their opinions in the note packet. Um, and so they are trying to be, like more, be more like DNA in this way. On the other hand, the notion that they could be like more like DNA analysts is very challenging for them. They really, um, it really clashes with their views about expertise, about the need for judgment, about sort of their own participation in doing analysis. So they talk about CMS in the lab that I studied, and they say, well, we just, it might provide certainty for some people, but not here, because we don't think it's conservative enough. Like, our judgment is better than CMS. Um, and so one of them was telling me, you know, oh, some people physically write on their notes. They'll mark up a group of seven, and they'll write it in a silver pen, times seven, and they think that makes them more objective than me. But it's a subjective discipline. It's the totality of the mark I'm looking at. There are a million factors that create the image, and it comes down to the subjective opinion of the examiner. So you can see where, although they're trying to be more like DNA, at the same time, 
it really clashes with the values that they have in their occupational group. Um, and this was true to varying degrees. I wish I could tell you all the stories, but you should read the paper because they're all in there. Um, different, like in chemistry, they have different, you know, sort of pressures to do things differently, and they feel differently about the, the sort of things, the sort of ways that they're pushed to be more like DNA. In general, what I think in terms of managing these tensions, if you look at the work that they're all doing, um, what you see is sort of the everyday kinds of work that they do in the lab really does matter for how they respond to this pressure. Um, there's this image of science, both, both in sort of the legal environment and in the public, and in general, I think juries and the court system tends to prefer mechanical objectivity to trained judgment. So that's part of what's pushing this. There's also a question of the intensity, what I'm calling the intensiveness of the judgment. Basically, how much work do you have to do as an analyst to get it to this point? And the interesting thing that I think is so interesting about this is that, to me, the DNA analysts and the firearms analysts did the most work. Like, they were the most similar in the amount of judgment that they used. Um, these are major cases. They're spending tons of time together kind of talking about what, what is it that we're going to put in the report. Um, so they are intensively using their judgment. Yeah. Thank you. Can you quantify what the equivalent, you know, to the 100 and 260 billion would be for firearms? There, I, there is no such quantification. That's part of the issue. Which is probably why they don't use it, because right. it's... It's no, I mean, it's, it's a completely, yeah, no, it's a completely different kind of analysis. So they, the thing with all of these other subfields is they can't do it the same way DNA does it. They can't. They're trying to look more like DNA, but they can't really be more like DNA. And they all are aware of that. And they've been trying for many years in a lot of these subfields to make themselves more quantified, right? So and fingerprints, for instance, started out that way and then moved away from that, and now they're kind of moving back. Um... Okay, so one of the things, like in the case of um, toxicology, toxicology is really a lot more, um, a lot less judgment intensive, and so they're kind of embracing some of the changes that came through in the NAS report. Uh, and then also there's this experience in the courtroom. So one of the things that's true of firearms is that they've been really, um, nobody questions their judgment. Um, so their, their evidence is a long-standing tradition in the court system that we accept firearms evidence. Um, so they've gone through lots of years where they don't get challenged. So this kind of challenge is new to them. So it's not surprising that they um, are getting kind of up in arms about it because they're really not used to facing courtroom challenges. Um, narcotics analysts face them all the time, so it's, it's sort of a different thing with them. Okay, so that's my first moment. Moment two is sort of writing the report. And report writing, so the thing about forensic science is it's just like every other science. It's a collective sort of experience. Um, there are no lone scientists in forensics. The tension here, though, is in the legal system, the forensic scientist signs off on their conclusions and their report, and then they have to go to court to support that and stand up and say, this is what I found, which is kind of different than, than science. And because of the fact that report is used in court and all of the documents are discoverable, the forensics report is really both a scientific document and a legal document. And I want to just tell you a story about gunshot residue, because I think this kind of illustrates what are the, sort of the tensions around this. Um, and so in, com in the comparative evidence area, what they do with gunshot residue is kind of interesting. They use a scanning electron microscope, so a big, huge microscope, um, very expensive. Nobody's allowed in the room with it except for the, for the analyst. Um, and they analyze gunshot residue. So this, is a, this stuff is what becomes gunshot residue. Um, and the way they collect gunshot residue in the field is they collect it on something called a stub. And they, a police officer will take a stub and rub it, rub one on the left and one on the right. They do left palm, left back, see, um, and for, for whoever they think has fired a gun. And gunshot residue particles have a characteristic size and shape. And so the SEM, the microscope, 
once it kind of locates that size and shape particle, it does an elemental analysis. And what it is looking for is the sort of combination of lead, barium, and antimony that's sort of characteristic of primer residue after firing. So that's what gunshot residue is. Um, in terms of the story, what happened in the lab while I was there is that the, the analysts really wanted to change the way that they were reporting out their analysis of gunshot residue. So one morning when I got there, they were all complaining about the way they write up the report. I was um, spending the day with a woman named Robin, and she said, you know, we all want to do it one way, and the deputy director of the lab wants us to do it another. And she was telling them, you know, we all agree that we don't want to report different results for the right hand and the left hand. So um, that information comes in on the notes with the evidence, right? It tells you which stub goes with which um, hand. Um, and the analysts have to keep very detailed handwritten notes about everything that comes in and what they're doing with it. Um, but they think that it shouldn't be reported. And basically what they were saying is, well, because what you're reporting is just whether the person has GSR on them, not what hand it's on. You know, one of them was kind of doing this gangster pose and saying, like, nobody's actually shooting with just one hand, um, but it's n so it's not right. Um, but And so they decide they're going to um, talk to the supervisor about it. So I actually ended up being with Robin when she was talking to Tim about it, and he looked at their procedures manual, and he says, well, the procedures manual says we report out the left hand and the right hand, but we can change that. And he asked if some of the analysts at other labs in the state, do they do it this way or don't they? Um, but Robin was basically saying, look, my concern is if we put that on the report, isn't it going to be confusing? Because it implies that one hand is shooting versus another. And for lay people, I think that would be misleading. And, and Tim, who's a shoe print analyst, says, well, we report one shoe versus another in shoe print cases. And she says, no, I mean, it might matter in a shoe print case. But the only reason we even run two stubs for GSR is because it, you lose tackiness. So basically, as time goes on, you want to make sure that you don't miss any potential GSR that might be on a suspect. If both are positive, we can report. But when one is positive and one isn't, we still report that this human had GSR on them. It's the same person. And it'll be weird and confusing to a layperson. It's misleading, it's cockeyed, she was really upset. Um, and all parts of your body are connected, and so anywhere you touch, you, ha you can you know, move, the GSR will move, right? So like this is the problem that she has, is that she doesn't think it's actually scientifically valid because of the way GSR works in the world, right? Um, and so the supervisor agrees to take it to the director, and then they, they sort of put out um, emails on their groups to sort of ask around the community, how do you guys do it? Um, ultimately, by the way, they don't make any change. But um, one of the things that was interesting to me is that sort of later, a few weeks later, I happened to be talking to the lab director. And um, I mentioned to him, he said, well, how's it going? And I always try to be as vague as possible when I talk to people in authority and organizations that I'm studying. And I'm like, oh, it's really interesting how much the legal environment affects what happens in the lab. And he says, oh, yeah, like the thing with the GSR reports. I mean, it was like the first thing he said. And he said, we've been around a long time, the deputy director and I. And we've reported out always that GSR on the right hand versus the left hand. And the staff's concerned that the DA might use this to mislead the jury in terms of their interpretation. Um, but what I tell them is they can't worry about that. It's out of their control. The DAs can do what they want with our information. And our role is just to provide them with the information. It's out of control how they use it. So I tell them, you just need to be comfortable with your analysis. You can't worry about what's out of your control. You can't spend too much energy worrying about this. I thought it was really interesting because they spend a lot of time and energy worrying about it. Yeah. So just a quick question about mm -hmm. the politics of that, um, because on your one of your very first slides, you were saying that a lot of the district attorney's offices uh, financially support some of these crime labs. So what does that uh, tension look like when making these decisions, and who ends up making the final decision? So in this case, the lab director makes the decision. Um, but there are definitely, I mean, I could tell you stories about sort of what is the tension around um, different types of analysis and when. Um, certainly, the law enforcement agency, 
makes decisions about what's going to get analyzed in consultation with the laboratory. So they're typically what happens is the police show up at the door, they have 100 beer cans from a party where somebody got stabbed and they want to do DNA analysis on them. And the analysts are like, don't you know how much this costs? Like, and this is totally not probative, right? So there's a back and forth. Um, one of the jobs of the roles of the supervisors in this lab is to be the pushing back person who says, oh, we're not analyzing 100 beer cans. Don't you have anything that would actually be probative for us to analyze, right? Um, you know, in the UK, they now have a limit on the number of um, pieces of evidence you can analyze with, uh, with for DNA per case. But in the US, we don't. And it varies, really, I think, by jurisdiction. So there's this back and forth push um, on that. There is less that they can there's just, they just don't know, right? So the law enforcement community and the legal community really doesn't understand what they do in the lab, so they're not really pushing them to do things in a certain way, um, except occasionally. Like, so I've definitely been in meetings where they've said, well, why can't you lower the threshold on that for like the toxicologists? Like, why don't you lower the threshold? Um, to, for whether or not somebody has drugs in their system. And they're like, that's not really how it works. <laughs> um, so certainly I've seen that on sort of in meetings, but um, the people who make the decisions are the supervisors and the lab director. The people who make decisions about, say, can you buy, can you hire two more analysts? Th that's the lab director, but he's also thinking about, well, how much do I have in my budget? And I think it varies by the relationship that the lab director has with the law enforcement agency. So it's possible that I, I definitely was in a lab where, I mean, honestly, like it took me four tries before I got into a lab. Um, the first three, I, I think part of the problem was that the relationship between the lab directors and the law enforcement agency wasn't as good. Um, and they didn't have as much latitude to have a stranger come in and potentially like throw a wrench in the works. OK, so what do I think about that story? What I think is, you can kind of see the tensions. If you look at the work here, you can see um, that the analysts are really thinking about the evidence in terms of whether it's scientifically valid and also whether it's legally probative, right? So they have both of these kind of concerns in the back of their heads. And um, they have very strong convictions about the science and the facts that the natural world presents. So they will totally get up in arms about things that they don't think are scientifically valid. Um, and in this case with GSR, GSR particles travel very fast. After six hours, um, you know, a GSR particle basically isn't even going to be on the hands of somebody who fires a gun in the real world, um, even if they didn't wash their hands, right? So like the GSR moves um, and they blow, they rub off, right? So um, they're easily transferred to anything that's touched, including other parts of the body. And so they got very worked up about, you know, it doesn't matter which hand it was on, that doesn't tell you anything about what happened. Um, and it really gave them agita, you know, they were like, they're going to take this crazy theory, it's not valid, you know, so it was very, um, it mattered to them a lot. And the other thing that matters and that you see is that there's this sense that they have that they're going, this evidence is going to be used in an adversarial legal process. And so they're thinking about this world, the legal world in which their work's embedded. And so they very carefully spend lots of time with the report. They will argue over in the, in, in the group, how are we going to word this? What exactly do we want to say about this? Um, and they're balancing sort of what is scientifically accurate with what's legally probative. And they're thinking about, well, what's going to happen with the jury if we say this? Um, and how a lay person might think about it. And there's also this issue for them about credibility and legitimacy. So they're thinking about, we don't want the results of our work to get twisted out there in the world, but also when we go up on the stand. So we want to make sure, if I'm taking the heat, I want to make sure this says what I actually believe. They don't want to see the work, the scientific work, get misrepresented, and they don't want to seem stupid. So they tell lots of stories about crazy lawyers, and they are very aware that the DAs can do what they want with their analysis. OK, so that's moment two. Do I have time for moment three? I don't know if I have time for moment three. Do you? All right, five more minutes. Moment three is about testimony. Oh, that picture didn't come out very good. Um, I'm just going to read you my story about testimony, and we'll forget about my analysis, because it's a really interesting story. Again, the person who is telling me the story is Tim, who's the supervisor of the Narcotics and Trace Evidence Unit. And 
Um, I didn't get to see a lot of testimony because, in fact, these guys don't testify very often. So in a, in a y- 18 months, um, I think in the year that I was there, the first year, like the calendar year, there were 90 testimonies in the entire lab. So that's 60 people, and there were close to 10,000 cases that they produced evidence for. So it's very rare. But it's also very um, salient. And so... Um, Tim told me this story about a case where he did a comparative analysis of shoe prints, and the prosecutor in the case didn't like the results that he came up with. And so he told me, okay, well, the district attorney didn't really like my answer. So he said to me, is there anyone else I can send it to? And I said, well, here's the guy who trained me a former chief examiner for the FBI for shoe print analysis. He literally wrote the textbook. So he's the man, okay? So if you don't like what I've said, here's who you want to talk to. So the prosecutor sent it off to him. Let's call him Joe. He says, so Joe contacts me and says, can you send the evidence out? I got it together. I shipped it out, and I shipped out a copy of my report, he said. And then Joe worked it up his way, and he and I talked afterwards. And I think I said the shoe was 10 and a half to 11 and a half, and he said the shoe was 11 to 12 or something like that as far as the size of the shoe. And the problem was that somebody had kicked in a door, and that was what the shoe print, the shoe print evidence is essentially a photograph of the footprint on the door. Uh, but the door is not flat anymore, right? So uh, they had collapsed part of the door with their foot. So we're trying to measure how big it is from a flat image of something that's bent, right? So. Um, Joe made certain assumptions, I made certain assumptions, and he and I were totally fine with it. We were discussing our individual reports, and from a science perspective, we agreed that it was a range, and our ranges overlapped. It was probably in that overlap area, but there was no guarantee. It could have been out. It could have been in the bell curves. We were fine with this, but the prosecution and the defense both wanted different answers. So the defense called me because their client's foot fell outside of my range, The prosecution called Joe because they wanted to get Joe's opinion because the suspect's foot fell into Joe's range. Okay, so he says, um, when the defense called me, here's the DA from my office, from our office, who I supposedly work for, trying to impugn my testimony. He put me up as incompetent, and he took conversations that he and I had had that were not part of the case, and he brought them up on the witness stand. And then afterwards, the DA was fine. He was like, let's grab a cup of coffee. I couldn't think of a sufficiently rude thing to say to him right then. I was going down my entire list of sailor words that I could come up with, and I couldn't think of anything sufficient. So, and then at the end, he says, you know, the lawyers just care about winning. They don't care about long-term consequences. They don't care about people's careers. It's all about winning this case right here, right now. And criminalists are not that way. The truth for us is going to be true tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So you can see, I think this story is really fascinating. Um, It sort of shows you this tension between what it is the lawyers are looking for, what it is the criminalists are trying to do. And then what I didn't talk about a lot, um, but what I think is also really important is that it has consequences. The, the criminalists see consequences. They see consequences for the victims. They see consequences for the suspects. But they also see consequences for themselves. Because he, the next time that Tim goes on the stand, a defense attorney can stand up and say, your DA doesn't think you're very good, does he? Right? Because he impugned your testimony the last time you were here. Right? So like, there are career consequences for these guys, not just in that sense, but also if they get it wrong, their career as a criminalist is pretty much over. They get pulled off of casework, and that's it. So the consequences of testifying are very high. All right. I have a whole bunch of stuff that I'm trying to get together on how they deal with this process on the stand and also how they manage the tensions. Um, and, and what I think is super interesting, but I actually haven't analyzed yet, is how, what, the, how thinking about what happens in testimony, which they are totally afraid of, almost to a person that I have to go testify, um, how thinking ahead to that really actually reverberates back to the process by which they p- produce a report and by even to the process of analysis, right? So it's really affecting a lot of different aspects of the work along the way. Summary. I think that the, um, what I'm trying to say here basically is that it's important to think about the work. 
um, because the process, by when you look at the work, you really see how the tech, how the technology change really has influenced what's going on there, and you see it in a very granular way, right? You see how like it happens within the lab, which is not something you might see if you just looked at. Um, sort of the law isn't keeping up with junk science or whatever. Um, it also shows the general pressure of public perception has on the work, which I think this is sort of a case of, you know, science in the public realm in some ways, and I think that that's really interesting. And then this, obviously, there's this clear tension between science and law in terms of values and practices. And then it also raises, I think, a lot of interesting questions. So it raises questions about how we evaluate scientific expertise. So as science is changing in this domain, what are we gonna do about all the cases that don't have DNA evidence? We can't really say, well, you have to be like DNA, right? So should we get rid of fingerprint evidence because you can't have population statistics about fingerprint evidence? Should we be trying to get rid of all ballistics evidence or, or what is it that we wanna do about it? Because many cases you don't have any DNA evidence. Um, also sort of thinking about it more broadly, I think this question of, and some of you guys are talking about education, which I think is another domain where you see this, like rising standards and rising technology, technological change. Like what does that do to the way that people actually practice the work, right? Because as standards go up, as we have this sense of you have to do it this way, there's less and less latitude given to actual people to do things. And I think this is happening across a lot of different domains. You see it in medicine, um, you see it in education, you certainly see it here. And then lastly, I think our images of how work gets done, how science work um, actually influences outcomes. So that's what I have. Thank you. Hi, I had a question from science studies perspective. Mm -hmm. So. I find it a little odd that you use the term science in the singular, as though it's two great institutions battling it out. So it felt <coughs> to me like those statues at Columbia's gates. We have science on one side and literature on the other. But then all of the post-1970s view of practice has been that it's messy. So both science and criminal justice is messy. And in there, it's very hard to get a precise argument. So when you say science, it seems to me you're talking about a very particular kind of science, which is post-war science, which is the datafication of the body through the genome project. And that changed all the other sciences, too. It changed biomedicine. It changed um, taxonomy. So it, is what you're talking about a very specific clash between you know, justice and science? Or is what you're talking about a transformation that's common across a number of spheres carried by a number of technologies about a new form of science that's called post-war science. Um, I probably wouldn't have put it that way, but I think it's the latter, right? So I think it's extremely specific. I certainly, I mean, I, when I talk about science in a, as a singular, uh, it's just, I think, a shorthand for thinking about some of the norms of science, maybe. But I actually am firmly in sort of a practice view of the world that it is very messy. Um, I am an ethnographer, so I don't really have data on sort of these larger trends, but I see them even in my own field. I mean, and you know, in academia, if you're a business school scholar, you no longer get evaluated, for the most part, on the quality of your publications, but the quantity. And we have a list of what are the top journals, and you have to publish in those if you want to get tenure, and you have to publish a certain number of, t and we're looking now at Google citations, not just Web of Science, but actually, like, how many people out in the world are citing what you're doing, right? Those measures, I don't think, reflect necessarily quality in the same way that the measures that I'm talking about here don't reflect um, judgment and, and truth, right? <laughs> so I think that what happens then in the framing of the two great institutions clashing is that the real political question is what you just said, which is that post-war science, the datification of everything from the body right down to metrics, plays into the messiness, that, mm -hmm. that the datification is the cause of the messiness of practice in a way that historically maybe practices like, it makes it much more difficult to call this a clash between great institutions when both institutions are subject to the same transformation towards these metrics that work on statistics and, and exist in that messy realm. 
Okay, I mean, I buy that, but I also think that what's more, what's interesting is what's actually happening sort of on the ground in response to that. Um, thinking about institutions really in just the organizational sense, do you have practical advice for how courts, labs, I mean, how should they grapple with some of this messiness? Because it seems like it's raising questions that are, are almost existentially threatening to them. Right. Um, do I have practical advice? So I have some. I mean, I've, I've, I've basically spent some time talking to people who practically care about this stuff. And so I have colleagues, um, some of you might be familiar with Simon Cole at Irvine, people who are sort of actively engaged in um, policy kinds of questions around what do we do about forensic evidence. Um, and I think that their answers are somewhat misguided when you consider what matters organizationally, right? So I think, I think almost everybody would agree, for instance, we should separate, like this question of politics is, is also a question of how much the labs are within the jurisdiction of um, law enforcement. Right, um, which is a really big, huge question um, that I think is a big, large issue, but everybody kind of agrees, but they can't figure out how to get it to be that way given the historical circumstances by which it got to where it is now, right? Um, so I would say, yeah, that would be great. Do I have practical advice for how you're going to fund all these folks without the law enforcement agencies? No. Nope. <laughs> um, but I do think like some people are sort of arguing, well, we should move it to PhDs run the lab and we have a bunch of lab technicians with no judgment who do the analysis. I have heard that said at some of these you know, policy meetings. I would completely disagree with that because like I was saying, I think a lot of this science is very messy and if you move it to a set of technicians who don't actually get expertise and really understand the technologies that they're using, you aren't going to get good outcomes in terms of the analysis. Um, and the other thing is you don't see too many PhD scientists in these labs because it is applied. It's not like a research science, right? Um, and historically, there have been some research groups at universities, but most of them have died. Um, and so it's not like something where there's lots of active research going on. So they pull research from other fields. I don't know. Those are two things that come to mind. Hi, thanks Beth for the great talk. I was like playing back in my mind all of the forensic science scenes for making a murderer <laughs> for, <laughs> for the last hour. Uh, but my question is actually about um, the be more DNA, be more like DNA. Um, as I understood, most of like what we are maybe expecting to see in the future in the firearms field will come probably from computer science and data mining, <coughs> and not necessarily from them specifically. So I was wondering about their feeling of agency, about is there anything they can do to progress this uh, field? Because I guess also the DNA field was progressed through engineering, right. not necessarily through biology. So, Yeah. Um, you don't get a really big sense of that when you sit in the lab. So I would say that they are pretty divorced from kind of what's going on. I mean, I think that it, it comes down to them as opposed to them being really actively engaged in. You know, some there are some folks who are, who maybe work with um, data scientists to create some of these databases. I, I would suspect that that's happening more at the FBI than in sort of the local labs that I studied. Um, so, so the be like DNA, the request from the um, manager, from the director, is there anything to it? Like, is there are they expecting anything, or just like it's a uh, just being said and kind of like uh, expected, but there's not any practical, you know, suggestions. Well, so one of the things that, um, that I didn't talk about was what happened in toxicology, which is when this report came out. So the where where you see like some of the push for people to change what they're doing is actually where it hits them hardest, which is like if I'm going to give testimony in court and I know that there's a defense witness who's a going to bring up the NAS report and say like your analysis doesn't have any. Um, you know, any um, measures of 
measurement error, say. So for chemistry, like that's what, you know, you don't have that. DNA has that, right? So DNA does all these, they keep records of all the measurement error that can happen I throughout their process. And the reason why they do this, by the way, is because they had to get vetted in the courts as a new forensic science. So it was really like a push for them to figure out how do we answer all of these court challenges. And so now those are coming, as a some of them are coming as a result of the NAS report. So in toxicology, they've started doing a bunch of stuff. To, to report out measurement error so that they can deal with the fact that somebody might ask them that on the stand. But it is very much a process of like, this is going to happen to us in a month on this case, so we better, we were planning to do this in three years, but we better do it now. Um, you mentioned that a lot of the practices in the organization of these labs is really based on where they're located and what their relationship is with um, kind of the local courts. Um, how do you think the fact that you gained access to the one that you did may shape kind of those findings? And I mean, obviously, they're not always going to be generalizable, but um, for what you saw. Yeah, so what I would say is, like I was saying earlier, I studied a DA lab so that, I mean, I think police labs have a reputation for having less latitude and less money um, than district attorney labs. <coughs> they both have, I think, less money than FBI labs or Department of Justice labs, which I think are better funded. Um, I'm not 100% sure of that, so don't quote me, but that's that was my feeling in this particular state. Um, but I think that the processes that I saw are pretty much going to be similar. So I think that the lab director probably has to do different things depending on their relationship with the police chief versus the district attorney or whatever. Um, in my lab, the lab director clearly had a lot of latitude. Um, I think it was no coincidence that he retired in, the, in my last month that I was in the field. He retired. Um, he felt like he could, he had gotten a new building for the lab. He had done all this stuff to make it state of the art and, you know, RFID and all sorts of ways in which it was a, a pretty, like, cutting edge laboratory. And so that was his reputation. And he also had a reputation for um, looking for more work for his lab. So he would contract out with jurisdictions to do some of the analysis that maybe they couldn't do. Um, and he charged a lot of money for that. Um, so he, you know, I think he was unique in that way, but I think that the processes that I saw, you know, at least from the ways that people talked to me at, at like criminalist association meetings and where people would tell me, I would say at least a quarter to a third of the people who worked in my lab had worked in other kinds of labs, in, even in other states prior to when they got to that lab. So I had a pretty good sense, and I would ask, like, is this like, you know, how is this different from when you worked in, you know, Westchester? I had somebody who worked in Westchester. So um, my sense is that it's pretty much similar, although I do think that um, the, the other unique thing about the jurisdiction that I studied was that it was very wealthy. Yeah. Thank you so much. I want to ask a question about legitimacy, because I think that's one of the things that's underlying a lot of the tensions that you've described or that you've seen erupt in practice, mm -hmm. um, and particularly competitions over legitimacy, um, which are probably also linked to competitions over who gets to decide what is true and also who gets to get which resources. So pr you've talked a lot about DNA being the princesses and DNA being sort of the gold standard and a lot of you know energy around are we DNA or are we not DNA. Um, and a lot of incomprehension across in intradisciplinary boundaries um, about the way that gun residue people do it versus the way that other people do it and whether or not they should all be subject to the same epistemic right. value slash culture. And I'm wondering, um, taking more of an institutional lens on that, like to what extent are many of these debates about specific practices set in this larger realm of debates about legitimacy? and whose science is legitimate, whose practices are legitimate, whose individual persons are legitimate in the courts, and, and which of these sciences is, or techniques is worthy of funding and also worthy right. of moving forward. So I'm wondering if it, I, it's kind of strange to take it back to something that is often associated with things like isomorphism mm -hmm. and large kinds of um, neo-institutionalism uh, neo claims, but I'm wondering like what legitimacy struggles look like for you on the ground being able to witness this as an ethnographer. Right. 
And I guess, so I guess part of that is thinking about sort of the institutional legitimacy of DNA following sort of when it became sort of the gold standard. So one of the reasons why there are 18 DNA analysts and four firearms analysts is because there is federal funding for DNA analysis. You can get Coverdell money to have extra analysts in your, in your lab. Um, and so you see this um, kind of shift towards what is because, like, but, but I also think like it's an interesting question, right? Because, I mean, historically speaking, like, I don't know, when the vacuum first came out, dust was like a big thing that forensics was looking at. So Ian Burney has this really cool paper on sort of dust and how, um, how dust became uh, forensic evidence. Um, and so like I think that there is this, it's hard to say sort of what's gonna happen next, right? So it could be that there's incredible you know, change in computing power and all of a sudden we can make matches of cartridge casings or fingerprints using, you know, computers more accurately. We definitely can't do it now, <laughs> right? So um, maybe that will become something that we fund um, once the breakthrough is made. Um, I don't know. I suspect, so first of all, I think that friends, if, you're, if we're talking about legitimacy more broadly, forensic science in, it, in and of itself as a discipline is not very legitimate, right? It is really an applied science. Um, the universities that grant forensic science degrees often do it through their extension departments, right? So, um, so there's that aspect of forensics as a whole. Um, I'm not sure any of this is answering your question, by the way, but I'm just kind of thinking about sort of... <laughs> right. But I, yeah, so, but I don't have data on that, but right, yes. <laughs> there's, and there's also the weird chicken and egg problem of like, well, maybe the gun people will figure out how to use computers and big data to get more credibility right, in their field, right. but of course that will require some investment in them as if they have something to do with computing anyway, so. And then a reach towards computing as the thing that grants legitimacy, right, which is largely right. what some of these other fields have done. So right. I think you're speaking, like, yeah, there's several related issues, and mm -hmm. so yes, it has answered my question. Okay. It's a fascinating <laughs> case. So I think we're gonna have to stop. I mean, just as a concluding remark, I think that like, what's really cool about this project is that it shows that data is always messy. Um, and it's something that, I mean, knowing the pressure right now into like predictive policing, risk assessment tools, and the use of computing techniques to make the criminal justice system much more certain and sure about guilt and about evidence, uh, we need to remember that basically that's how data gets made. And it's very messy. And we forget about it when we look at algorithms because algorithms are closed, right? So I think that's, that's the lesson I'll take from it. Okay. And join me in thanking Beth uh, for this great presentation. Yeah.